So first, before we think about table models at all, um, brief introduction about how table models work. So what technology or what's the magic behind table models? To understand that, um, you first want to think about what type of material uh, are we working with, historical material. In some occasions, historical material was um, captured in a tabular format. And with table models, you now have the ability with Transcribus to capture this tabular data also in tabular form that you can eventually export that data to an Excel file, to an XML file, to uh, yeah, virtually the format you would like to use it in, and then also uh, make further analysis or other uh, applications that you can think of. Yeah, in this example, it looks something like this. So table models automatically detect these tables and extract it as structured data. So basically, you get a table in as output from, from these models. But how does this work? To understand how table models work, it's important to understand um, what are we doing from a technical perspective. It's called segmentation. So we basically take the image that is given to the model, and the model tries to segment it, so to identify different parts of the image um, and what part of that or what that single part of the image is representing. There's one uh, approach, which is segmentic segmentation, that is basically labeling pixels on a class basis. So models that use seg semantic segmentation assign classes, like here in this example, Human is in red, sea is in yellow, sky is in blue, and sand is in purple. And like this, you know, okay, there's four different types of classes that the model has recognized um, successfully. But what you don't know is how many people there are on the image. You just know that there is one class of a human. Now, what we use for table models is, is instance segmentation, because you need to identify every single instance of a given thing or a given um, object that is on an image. Here, now with instance segmentation, as you see it in example, there are three different different objects detected, three different uh, persons that are on the image. And here, it's not just that the pixels are labeled with a class, but every single object is detected as such. And that's the very um, yeah magic behind the table model with this technology adapted to historical documents, we are able to recognize uh, tabular data. In short, yeah, we identify this tabular data from historical documents and are able to export it into spreadsheets. Now let's briefly have a look at how that works in Transcribus. The usual process uh, until last year in Transcribus was to first recognize the layout and then the text. So you first needed to identify where the text is on the image, and then you could extract the text from that image, and then eventually export it, carry it, or do whatever you wanted to do with the material. Um, yeah, here just as a brief reminder, layout recognition, so basically the recognition of the text, is also a model that is used during text recognition in Transcribus. It can be executed separately, but also together with text recognition uh, segmentation, so uh, segmentation for the lines is done. But now with table models, we add one more step to this uh, process, which is uh, tables. So we don't only want to extract the lines, so where the text is on image and the text itself, but we also want to have the structured information, how that text is aligned on the image. Um, and with that, we need to have another model, the table models. It adds one step to our process, but it also adds value. And that's what we thought that is a very good tool to introduce into Transcribus. And eventually the same, you can also export and share it um, with some advanced export options in, in Excel. So uh, table models, and that's a very important thing. Here is how table models work is with the object uh, detection. So the instance segmentation is recognizing rows and columns. So once we approach this problem, so how do we recognize tables? In a given image, we came to the conclusion that one approach could be that 
there are basically two models running. One is recognizing the columns, the other the rows. This gives us the advantage that we are not bound to uh, documents where there are visual separators, for instance. So if your data is structured in a certain way, you can extract also only column data or only row data from a given image. There are no general models yet. We are currently training some of them. They are uh, not finished yet. We will try to release them soon. Um, but in general, tables are in their intrinsic um, structure, very similar. They have rows and columns. That's what they share in common. Um, but still, there are differences to the extent of how many lines there are in a certain cell, how many lines there are in general, how many columns there are. So there are is a chance that we are able to produce some models that will have a very good out-of-the-box performance, but still for many use cases, um, it might be needed to train your own model. Once you hear more about training your own model, you will also see uh, that you can really quickly train your own table model. And as I said, there is no need for separators. So there, there do not need to be any lines between given columns or rows. So if the, from a visual perspective, the data is structured in some form that you can visually tell, OK, that's a row, that's a column. Also, the model will be able to tell that apart and then recognize the rows and columns as such. And with enough training data, you can also handle different types of tables in your model. So as you might know, there's not just one type of table. There might be multiple type, types of tables in your material. You can also train your model to handle those different types of, of tables. Here are some examples. In this example, for instance, you can see there's no visual separators uh, whatsoever. So we have some tabular data. So you can tell there's rows, there's columns. They're, they're not separated by horizontal or vertical lines. But still, the model is quite capable of recognizing those rows and also this, these columns. This is basically how the table is then constructed. Once we have recognized the rows and the columns, they are matched uh, against each other, and you end up having a nice table with columns and cells. Here's an example of how that looks like. You have rows and columns, and um, all the cells are recognized nicely. You can also work with skewed tables. So the tables don't need to be super straight. Um, the models will learn to recognize those rows in, in the example, but also the columns in some way, also in a, in a, in a skewed way. As said, tables don't need to have just a single line of text in it. So the model actually does not care about the text. It just cares about how you train it to behave in terms of recognizing rows and columns. So you can also have um, tables where you have multiple lines of text in a given cell. And one very important aspect before I hand over to my colleague is how do we know when to use a field model? That's in principle, the same technology as table models, but with a different kind of post-processing way of handling the data that is recognized. So do we use field models? We um, have this similar technology to table models or table models. And here we try to gather some, some yeah, insights or some inputs for your um, uh, use cases. In the end, you still might want to try it out and see what works better for you. But in general, field models are yeah, more adequate for complex layouts. So if you have um, structured information on your images, but not in a quite tabular data, you might want to rather opt for field models. You also can have uh, data where you have different fields or regions, like headers, addresses, marginalia, specific text areas that you might want to Extract in that case as well, it's better to use a field model. As you can see on the bottom right, for instance, if you only want to extract three fields from this given image, then it's better to use a field model. As you might also think, OK, that some sort of table, you could try to train a table model. But in this very occasion, if you want to limit the extraction of your data to yeah, some given uh, object cells on the image, then it's better to use a field model. And yeah, and what you cannot do with table models as well, that's something you can do with field models, but not with table models, is label table cells. So if you have four different columns, for instance, or five, and every column has different data in it, like name, address, 
birth date, whatever, you cannot at the moment at least label these these columns so that the label the first column is the name, the second column is place, and the third column is the birth date. It's currently not possible. You can do that with field models. So you can train a model, a field model to recognize given regions and label them as well. But that's currently not possible with table models. What is possible with table models is process material that has clear rows and columns. As I said, it does not need to have visual separators. So there's also a historical material, as you might see on the bottom right, for instance. This is some form of structured data. You have some running text on the right and some information on the left. This is a good case for a table model, for instance. You can train your table model to extract this block as a cell and these here as cells as well. So um, in, in this case, you can train the field model to extract that information quite nicely. It needs to have some read-like form of data uh, in, in terms of layout. Then you can use table models very nicely and can extract that data to use it in an Excel sheet or uh, in the format that you would like to use it um, after you uh, export it. Um, yeah, that being said, I would like to hand over to my colleague now, uh, Helene, who will guide you to, through the process of training uh, a model or preparing the data for training. So over to you, Helene. Thank you. Yes, so we had the introduction. Thank you, Flo. Um, and as you mentioned, we now want to figure out how do we actually prepare the training data. As you know, when we want to train a model, we need to have some data that we give, transcribus that we give to the AI so that they can learn with it. So how do you get from the table that we already have here to the accurate layout that we can feed basically to transcribus? Usually, maybe as you know, you've had used transcribus before, we have public models that are pre-trained. We don't have them yet. So if you have material where you don't have a public model yet, then you use the custom models. So for table models, you can train custom models that are tailored exactly to your material, to your tables. And with this, you can control the data that goes into the model. So data here is again, the information and the tables, the right layout that you train the model with. So to do that, the custom AI model uh, training uses specific examples to help the AI to recognize and understand the layout. And to train the custom model, we need to prepare these specific examples. So we have here again, the training workflow we can see the three steps. First, we have to accurately draw the tables and save them as ground truth. So accurately drawing these tables basically means that we create these specific examples uh, to train the model. To create the ground truth, we need to use the transcribus editor to create the tables, including the columns and rows. And the amount of pages that we need to create the right amount of ground truth depends on the table. So if we have very easy tables with a very simple structure, 20 pages can be enough. If it's more difficult, 50 pages are better. And if it's a mix, then we do recommend between 50 and 100 pages of ground truth. That also depends on the number of tables though. So let's have a look into the editor. Then I can show you how you can create the ground truth. Okay, so here we have my collection with uh, my document, which is which are these tables. You can see the images here. And let's open one, and then we can see our image with the table structure. Okay, so how do we add a table here? We go to the editor bar, and you can see here this button that immediately shows this button add table, you click on it, and then you click on the point where you want to start to have the table and drag it over the page. You can see here in orange, and you can click at the end of where you want the table. Now we add the rows and columns. Actually, maybe let's move this up a bit. I'm pressing on shift and dragging the region up a bit. So now we adjust it here. 
Now let's add the rows. To do that, select the region or the table in this case, and then you can press the letter H on your keyboard and you can see this horizontal line appears. So this is easy to remember because it's H for horizontal and you can pull it or drag it to where you want your row to end or start. Click and now you can see you have the separator here. Let's maybe do one here as well. We can basically do how many we want. We can also make smaller columns, maybe separate it here again. So just to show you how that works. Uh, then to add the vertical lines, or basically the columns then, you press V. And as you can see, a vertical line appears. And now again, by just dragging it to where we want it, and clicking on the table, we are creating columns. If you see here that the line is maybe a bit slanted or skewed, you can press on C, like cut, and use the arrows on your keyboard to really get the right, maybe even slightly skewed line. And now you have it matched better to the actual separator on the image. So these are some um, helpful tips on how you can create tables. Um, what you can also do, as mentioned before, is you can add tags to the table. To do that, you can click on, an, um, on a cell or you can select, for example, a whole column and then use the right click button on your mouse. And here we have, for example, some tags that we previously added but you can always go to settings, tags, and then edit tags in collection settings. And here you can add more tags. So if you work with specific documents here, for example, we have a, a column that says religion. So you can add a tag for religion or uh, the name. So def depending on what documents you're working with, you can definitely add uh, tags, the tags that you need. Um, one thing that is also good to Maybe know to here, her, her, yes, her sorry, movie. sure. Tags, as I said before, they can be added manually, but they are currently not part of the training. So the model is not learning to add these tags to the tables later. And so apparently that's still a manual process that uh, we might work on that and to have it part as a part of the model as well. Currently, uh, that's, that's not part of the training then. Training really just learns to recognize the rows and the columns. Yeah, that's, that's good to add here as well, especially when we're talking about tags. Thank you. Um, important thing here is to, first of all, save your changes. And here you can also change the status of your page. So if you've not worked with documents in Transcribus before, the status basically is an indicator on what stage of the transcription or editing product process you are. So if we're in the progress of creating round truth, it is very helpful to also save your page that you've worked on as ground truth. So I've selected ground truth, click on save. And if we go back, we can see here with the color indication that this page is now saved as ground truth. I have some other things that are good to know tips basically, and I will show them to you in a different document. And these um, are for, these good to know tips basically are for special cases. So one thing to know is that table models currently cannot recognize two tables in the same image. So as you can see here, we have two separate tables, one here and one here. And here we do recommend that you split it into two. So if you have this here, you split it into two and have two separate tables uploaded or this page that um, split into two and have this in two pages uploaded to Transcribus. Um, also, if you have two page scans with two different tables, this also um, is meant for that, that you better split the pages and then upload it. Another thing is, is that 
transcribos are basically the table models to specify that table models don't yet work with merged cells. So what are merged cells? It's when you see here that instead of all of these being separate, they're one big cell. So you can merge cells, you select the different cells, for example, here by clicking on one, pressing control, and then selecting another one, and then by pressing M on your keyboard, you can see now that those two cells are merged. So you can merge cells, but keep in mind that the table structure edit, the table models cannot be trained to recognize or to, um, um, how do you say, also use basically this as a training material. The table models work with a grid view structure. So when it has those irregularities in the table view, uh, it does not work with the training. You can see this also, um, we have the reminder that we made a change and didn't save. Um, yes, we can also see that I think in this one where we have here, for example, the header being uh, merged or these smaller headers also being merged cells. And then another thing that is good to know is that as you can see here, the cells have been adjusted, but there is no need to adjust the cell borders for the text that is overlapping, as you can see here, because the model always draws straight lines. So the adding of the baselines is a separate step, so you don't need to adjust the cell borders. Maybe and lastly... Just, very briefly, added, yes. so in terms of logic, what, the, what transcribers will do is always adding the text to that cell where the majority of the text is. So regardless if the text is outside of the cell to some extent, it will always be added to this cell. There are some edge cases where the text is right in the middle of two cells and you can visually even hardly tell is it part of this or that cell. In that case, it might be that the text is uh, yeah added to the wrong cell. But generally speaking, you don't need to have this workaround or a very thorough uh, representation of your table. Thank you for clarifying. And um, the last good to know tip is, and we had that question before, and the question was about headers. So including headers is optional. You can include them, but you don't have to include them. Um, it depends also if you think of the merged cells, how you wanna deal with that. And if the header is identical on all the pages, if you're working with tables where the header stays the same, excluding it will give you a clearer result. And so also a clearer result in the export. So should you decide to export the documents. That is it from my part. I will now hand over to my colleague, Sarah. Lene, so I've explained- can you just show yes. where the shortcuts sure. are? Uh, because there are oh, some yes. questions in the chat, so maybe we can show where they can uh, see the list of all the shortcuts. Of course, thank you. So you stay in the editor and you move to those three dots in the top right corner of your screen. You click on them and then you see here keyboard shortcuts. You click on keyboard shortcuts and you get a list of all the different shortcuts that you have. So creating a text line. Here we have, again, merging two elements, which I, which I mentioned before, or splitting elements horizontally or, for, or vertically. So in case you need a, a quick reminder and you're not sure how to split um, a table, for example, you can always go to these keyboard shortcuts and maybe you find even more that, that are useful. As you can see, it's quite a long list. So a lot of helpful information there as well. All right, I think we have covered how to create the ground truth and how to edit and create tables, rows and columns. So I'll stop screen sharing and I'll hand over to you, Sarah. Yes, thank you, Leah. Now I'm going to share my screen. And uh, we will talk about uh, uh, training uh, um, a table model. So we are here. We have uh, um, 20 pages uh, of uh, grant router. And if I open the page, uh, you see there is the grant router. To train a table model, is it's enough to have the table structure. You don't need uh, to transcribe uh, the content. Uh, 
inside uh, of the table. Uh, just the table structure is uh, enough. You select uh, the, the documents uh, or the pages uh, with your ground truth. So now we are just going to select uh, my, uh, my document with the 20 ground truth pages. You click here and you have uh, the possibility to train uh, four different types of uh, models. So the text recognition model uh, is the model trained uh, on the text. Uh, Baselines, the models are trained on the, the lines, uh, and fields model and table models are for regions. Uh, in our case, we want to train uh, a table model. So we click here, and uh, my, um, my document uh, has already been selected. Uh, you can add here other documents uh, if uh, you miss them uh, uh, before. And you can also decide uh, if you want to include uh, the latent transcription or the grant root transcription. Um, if you select a grant root, uh, only the pages saved as a grant root uh, will be uh, selected. Grant root is a term uh, used in machine learning uh, to indicate uh, the training data. And we use it also in transcribers. Uh, and the grant root is the perfect uh, examples, uh, in this case, the perfect tables uh, manually drawn on which the model will learn. During the training process, uh, we need to feed uh, the machine uh, with uh, training data, in this case, uh, the, the grant root. Uh, and so the machine can learn uh, from our examples uh, and will do the same uh, on new pages. During the training, uh, our grant router is split into groups, the training data and the validation data. The training data are the pages on which the model is actually trained. The validation data are some pages set aside during the training and the model uses them to attest the accuracy, its accuracy during the training. So it tests itself on those validation pages. Um, here we have already selected the, the, the document with uh, the grant root with the training data, so we can go to the next uh, slide, uh, to the next page, uh, and here we can decide uh, uh, how we want to select uh, the validation data. Uh, by default, the Transcribus uh, uh, makes uh, an automatic selection of 10%, uh, so two of my 20 pages uh, have been uh, assigned to the validation data. You can also decide to do a manual selection, but uh, we recommend uh, to, to stick with the automatic selection because in this way, you are sure that uh, um, it's selected uh, randomly. So there is a variety of material uh, in the validation data. We go to the next page uh, and here we have uh, to add uh, the model uh, the name of the model uh, and also uh, a description. Uh, this description is mainly for, for you. So here you can uh, um, write some notes uh, to remember on which uh, type of table. So the model uh, uh, was trained uh, or on how many pages, uh, if you include different type of tables, so you can uh, write here or the, the details. Uh, if you want, you can add uh, a, an image URL to have here the, the thumbnail. At the moment, uh, it needs to be, you can only use external URLs, so not a, a URL from Transcribus. And here under advanced settings, uh, you can change uh, the training cycles and the learning rate. We recommend to stick with those numbers, uh, especially if you are training tables model for the first time. Uh, the training cycles um, indicates how many time uh, how many times the models go, goes through um, the training data. So in this case, is uh, five ton five uh, hundred times, uh, um, and you can uh, increase uh, it uh, up to ten thousand. Uh, but uh, I mean, for a small uh, model, uh, but even if you have a uh, um, 200 uh, pages, uh, uh, 5,000 uh, training cycle is enough. And this is the learning rate. Uh, so uh, how quickly the model adapts to the data, how quickly the model learns. Uh, um, it, mm, 
it, please don't uh, change uh, this value because if you try to increase it, uh, the model could uh, learn uh, quicker, but uh, there is also the risk uh, that uh, uh, the model overlooks some details. So it, the result is, isn't that good in the end. And we go to next and we have a, a recap of, uh, of the model we have trained and then we can start uh, our training. Uh, you are directed to the jobs uh, um, view and here you can see, see that uh, our table model training uh, was uh, created. And if I refresh it, uh, probably we will see that. Uh, yeah, we are lucky because uh, it's, it failed, uh, probably I said something wrong, but uh, yeah, you should see that uh, um, first uh, the status is uh, created, uh, then uh, running, uh, and then it will be finished. Uh, and uh, you will uh, receive also an email, email when the training is uh, is finished. Uh, and if we go to... I think models, it might be us that is causing this. Okay. As we're running currently a large training, <clears throat> and space is limited on the machines where the training is run. So I'll check it in the meantime. But we were prepared, so we trained it the same model yesterday. Uh, and if we go here, and they're private models, so your model by default uh, will be private. I think yesterday training this model took uh, like a couple of hours, so not that long. Uh, and here we have uh, uh, the model trained on 18 pages, uh, because two pages were used for, uh, the, uh, for the validation uh, set. And here you can also see um, a recap of your training set size. So uh, the model was trained on 18 pages and on 18 uh, tables overall. Um, the number of tables uh, should all always be lower than the number of pages uh, because, or the same uh, or lower, because uh, at the moment transcribers uh, cannot uh, train models uh, with multiple pages. Uh, with the multiple tables on the same page. Um, and then you can look also at the description of, uh, of the model. And here you see also the learning curve. And there are two curves in reality, because as Flo explained, explained before, um, there are two, um, two elements. Uh, first, uh, the recognition of the rows, and then the recognition of the columns. So this is the reason why the curves looks like, uh, like this. How can we evaluate uh, if a model that we have trained is, uh, is good? Uh, we have to look uh, at this uh, uh, value called the uh, mean average, average precision. So it's the value here. Uh, in the, the case of this model is uh, 41%. The mean average precision is a complex measure. Uh, in brief, uh, it evaluates how accurately the system detects uh, rows and columns. Uh, uh, and compares, compares the automatic detection uh, with our ground truth. Uh, don't be scared by a lower number. I mean, in general, 41% uh, seems like a low number, but uh, in, in reality, based on our experience, uh, table models with uh, a mean average precision over 40% uh, or even over 35% uh, are are, can already deliver satisfactory results. So don't, don't not only look at the um, value here, but also test uh, the model uh, yourself uh, on some pages uh, to really see how the model performs. Uh, and we will look uh, in a few minutes how it performs on new pages. Um, if you're not happy with uh, the, the result of the first model, you can always uh, use this model to create a new ground route and uh, improve your model. So when you have a first version of the, your model trained uh, on 20 or 50 pages, but you want to improve it, uh, you can apply the model uh, on a new set of pages uh, on more uh, up new 50 pages, uh, for instance, uh, you can adjust uh, the, the tables uh, and this uh, will be quicker uh, than uh, manually drawing all the tables by scratch. Uh, you can save this, them as ground root uh, and then you can train a new model uh, um, using as ground root uh, the old ground root uh, and also the new uh, ground root. Uh. And this would probably lead to, for sure will lead to better results. Uh, it, another series of tips, uh, 
Um, as we have said, the uh, tables model cannot be trained to automatically tag the columns uh, and the cells. Uh, so you can tag them uh, when you create the ground truth, uh, but uh, the model won't, doesn't learn uh, to add them uh, automatically. So if the structure uh, of your um, table uh, is... Um, is very consistent. I think the better way to do it uh, is to add uh, those uh, tags uh, uh, later um, in, outside of transcribus if you need uh, them. Uh, and uh, um, during the training, uh, we have seen that uh, you get better results uh, if you ex exclude the pages uh, without tables. Uh, so include only the pages uh, that uh, have uh, tables uh, when you train the model. Uh, and if the if during the recognition the model uh, encounters uh, some uh, pages uh, um, without tables, uh, uh, it is um, those pages won't be recognized. So the model doesn't attempt to uh, create a tables on a page without a table. And in the case uh, of uh, uh, writing uh, that overlaps the separators. Uh, this can be quite a tricky for tables. Uh, so here it uh, really depends on the type of table you are working with. Uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, enough uh, to um, the feature built in transcribus uh, to when a line overlaps uh, the, the cell, uh, overlaps the separator. There is a, a feature that we will see uh, that you can enable uh, and transcribers still recognize uh, the, the overlapping part of the line as uh, one line. Uh, sometimes uh, it's more difficult, uh, so you need uh, to use another approach, uh, for instance, a film model, uh, or uh, you have to manually um, correct uh, those, uh, those lines. Uh. Um, I have two questions mm -hmm. that we can maybe answer here when it comes to training a model. Um, one was the question if, um, let me see, if the image URL points to a local image, so I think that refers to the model setup, when you can add an image, if I'm understanding the question correctly. No, you... It should be an image uh, on the internet uh, with an uh, accessible URL. So a Wikipedia image, uh, is, uh, it's okay. But if it's a local image on your uh, computer, uh, it doesn't work. Okay, thank you. At the moment, I think we would like to improve it so you can choose uh, an image from your ground router uh, and show it uh, as a... Uh, as the thumbnail of your model, but uh, yeah, it's not possible at the moment. Thank you. Okay, now we will see directly in Transcribus uh, how to uh, ex use uh, a table model. So we are um, here. Um, of course, you have to uh, use the table model uh, on a page on the same type of tables uh, on which you have trained it. Uh, because if you use it on a different type of table, uh, it will give you worse results. So we are here. It's the same type of table. And you go here under recognition. You go to table models. And we already have we have our private model. And you select the ether. So the first step. Uh, uh, it's always uh, to uh, run uh, the table recognition. And it would now take uh, a few seconds. Okay, so the first step uh, is the table recognition. Then we have the second step, uh, which is the baseline recognition. We need uh, to find uh, the lines uh, inside uh, uh, of the cells, uh, and then we can do the text recognition to actually transcribe uh, the text uh, inside the cells. Uh, so you see here, this is the result uh, with uh, a model, a table model trained uh, on just uh, 20 pages. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, we also have to consider that uh, this table is uh, quite, uh, um, yeah, it's very regular and easy to learn. Uh, but you can see that uh, you don't need uh, a lot of ground truth to get uh, good results with uh, tables. So, 
The second step is uh, the layout recognition. So we want uh, to find uh, the, the lines of text inside of cells. And we go here and we click to layout. Here you can choose uh, the baseline model that you want to use. We recommend to use uh, universal lines uh, or mixed line orientation. Mixed line orientation is the one used by default uh, in Transcribus, uh, so you can also go with it. Uh, but you have to remember to select uh, uh, some advanced settings, and this is really important. Uh, first, uh, you need to select uh, this one, uh, keep existing, uh, because we already have uh, uh, text regions. In our case, we already have our uh, um, tables. Uh, so we want to keep uh, the table structure and uh, just recognize uh, the lines inside uh, of the table structure. Um, then other elements that could be helpful uh, to modify here are this one, split lines or region border. Uh, in this way, uh, lines uh, that are close once to each other but belongs to different uh, cells uh, are split uh, as two different lines. Uh, and here you can modif modify the line overlap uh, fraction. Uh, so if one line uh, slightly overlap uh, the cell border, but it's part uh, of the, the cell where uh, most of the lines uh, is, is located. Uh, you can uh, use this, uh, this, uh, this fraction here to enable this, uh, this feature and make sure that uh, even if it's slightly overlap, uh, it's, it's still recognized as part uh, of, the, mm, of the line. Uh, and the tables uh, could be also helpful to decrease uh, the minimal baseline length. Uh, it's not the case of the table I'm working with, uh, but uh, there are some tables uh, where there, mm, some lines uh, are really short. Uh, maybe there, there are numbers uh, just with one digit uh, or a digital signs, uh, which they are very short uh, baselines. Uh, so it could be helpful to set the minimal baseline length uh, to low. Uh, and so um, even uh, uh, baselines uh, that are 10 pixels long uh, are uh, recognized. And uh, then let's close the settings and we can start uh, our recognition. Uh, and after that, uh, the next step uh, is uh, the uh, text recognition. Uh, the process is the same. In the case of the text recognition, you have to choose uh, the text model uh, uh, that works uh, um, better with your sources, uh, depending on the type of script uh, and language. So now you see we have the uh, the lines. The lines have been uh, recognized uh, and also split here, uh, where the, the the border, the cells border is. Um, uh, under recognition, uh, you can use one of the public models uh, on, or a model that you have trained uh, and with, uh, um, text, uh, with tables uh, and usually with numbers, uh, the text type uh, is a very strong model uh, um, and it's very good at recognize uh, numbers. So. And here we have just to, to wait uh, for the recognition to, to go through, but I uh, have also uh, another page, okay, and here you see on this page uh, the final uh, the final result. Uh, we have uh, the table recognition, the baseline recognition, and in the end, uh, the text uh, recognition. Uh, and you can decide uh, to export uh, it uh, or to work uh, within uh, Transcribus. You can also change uh, the view if you prefer to work uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this way. Uh, for the export, uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. Can you just briefly go back to the settings intro again, where the settings are, especially for baseline settings? Mm -hmm. I think it's yes. interesting to know those settings. Uh, we yes. are here, layout, uh, under advanced settings. Um, the most important one is this one. So uh, you under a generation of text regions, uh, layout blocks, uh, you have to select the keep existing uh, text regions. Uh, otherwise, Transcribus will create a new text regions, uh, but without considering them as stable. But uh, Transcribus would consider the page uh, like a normal text page, uh, not as a table. So we need to make sure that uh, Transcribus uh, uh, respect the uh, 
takes into consideration the table structure. And then here there are a lot of different settings that you can uh, choose and you can read uh, more about them in the help center. Uh, or we also have, a, I think, I think we also have a, a webinar on that uh, next year, probably. Uh, and yeah, the important setting for tables based on our experience are here, the minimal baseline length. Uh, it's often useful to set uh, is, uh, it to low to also recognize uh, very short uh, lines like uh, the ones containing data signs. And then uh, um, we recommend to select uh, this option, split lines uh, on region border. Um, I can also show you what happens when we don't split uh, if. Uh, so if we don't split uh, lines on a region border, lines uh, tends to be merged. If they're close one to each other, they will be they are merged together in, in one big line. So let's see what, uh, what happens here. Um, maybe this page is not that good because I already have the text recognition on, on Ether. Um, yeah, so the, I'm not splitting the lines uh, on the region border. And let's see what the, what happens. Uh, would... Maybe in the meantime, we can answer another question. Um, so if you can instruct the model to that particular, a particular column contains letters or numbers, that is possible through a, a quite uh, labor-intensive workaround. But yeah, you can finish that and then let's have a look. Yes, you see here, uh, I, haven't, uh, I didn't select the split uh, lines on region border. And these two uh, lines uh, are merged together because uh, the model is just looking at uh, um, how they are on the page uh, without considering that they belong uh, to two different uh, uh, cells uh, or yeah to different cells or text regions. Uh, so to make sure that uh, the lines uh, are split correctly uh, and assigned co to the correct uh, cell, you have to flag uh, that uh, uh, that option when you work with tables. So, and you see also here another example. This has been recognized as one long line uh, instead of three different uh, lines. And this would uh, be a, is a problem when you work with tables uh, because it means that uh, it the text only ends in one cell. Okay, do you want to continue the... Yeah, so how, how you would uh, tell the model that you only want to recognize a certain cell with one model and another uh, cell or column with another model? You would need to use tags, so tag the columns with a certain structural tag, and then restrict the recognition to that tag. So you could use yeah whatever tag you want to assign to a cell, and then when you run the text recognition, um, that's only possible for all models. But the text item, um, you can restrict it on structural tags. Uh, let's say paragraph whatever. So that column, you want to recognize that column with some model and another column with another model because you have different types of scripts in the material. You could you know, use it like this. Will be a workaround as you cannot assign these tags as it is right now to the different columns, but at least manually you can split it and run different models on different sections of your material. Yeah. Uh, um, if there are no other questions, I would just show you how to uh, export it. Mm. So you have to select your document and you click uh, here on export. Um, you can export uh, tables in the format that you want. Uh, for example, if you want to keep, uh, if you want to have uh, all the coordinates of the table, you can export it as a, a page XML, but the uh, most useful um, export uh, format uh, is for sure a spreadsheet. And here you can decide uh, if you want to have uh, the table, uh, the normal table exporter or to merge uh, 
all the pages into one table and have an example here. So this is the normal exporter and you get a, um, one sheet per, per page and the first uh, um, row contains uh, the, uh, the name uh, of the image and then you have your uh, uh, the transcription of this page. And if you select uh, uh, the option to have uh, all the pages exported in one table, this is how it looks like. Um, so it's just one sheet and you have here the transcribus page number and here the um, transcribus, uh, the uh, file name, the original file name. Uh, and yeah, if you, if, in the case you haven't transcribed uh, the the header, you you haven't included it uh, in your your model. You can just uh, add here uh, a run above um, a row above uh, and write uh, the the header for and have it for all the, the entire spreadsheet. I think I will hand over to you, Flo, to wrap up. Yeah, you're slightly overrunning. Sorry for that. Let's quickly wrap it up. Um, have a look at the last couple of slides. And then um, we had a good webinar. I think we tried to answer many of the questions already in the chat. Um, yeah. Um, what is Prescribus? Just a small recap. Well, our self understanding is that we are an AI powered ally. So we try to support the work that all of you are doing with historic documents. We want to provide the best tools for doing so. And our answer to this is Transcribus. Um, for this, we also need to have some sort of business model to support this. As you might know or might not know, we are a cooperative. So um, from a legal point of view, for profit, but by statutes, we are a non-profit. So basically we are not paying out any shares or dividends to our owners, which are mainly public institutions, universities, private persons. So a very um, a diverse group of uh, shareholders in our cooperative. And we are basically, our sole focus is to kind of further develop Transcribus. And for this, we have introduced subscription plans um, back in January. You can see them here. Um, this is uh, the way how we try to make the usage of the platform fair, as you might uh, imagine to run all this infrastructure, we need a lot of um, servers and hardware to run Transcribus. We need to develop the tool. We need to further maintain the tool. And for this, we also need to somehow support the development of, of this platform. And here, um, yeah, we try to have a very fair way of accessing the platform by offering subscription plans where you can subscribe to the plan that is suited best for your use case. But we also, uh, that's the next slide after this then, um, yeah, to just recap, our mission is to provide the best tools. So we really uh, try to provide the tools because the fun part is on your end. Um, you can work uh, with the material. We are handling the technical part and you're handling uh, the part of analyzing and getting information out of the data that you can extract with Transcribus. But what I wanted to add to the slide before is that we also offer a scholarship plan. So we come from academia. We were uh, founded during uh, two EU projects, and we really try to give back as much as possible. So aspiring researchers, but also teachers can apply for transcribus scholarships, which are basically then uh, granted in form of free subscriptions. And yeah, you can just check it out on our website. So we try to support as many projects as possible with this to yeah, foster innovation by giving researchers the, tool, the tools they need um, for doing the yeah, very valuable research on historical documents. That being said, we also try to provide as many help sources as possible, because there's a lot of things you need to know when using Transcribus, as you just have seen. Um, there's a saying that nobody knows uh, everything about Transcribus, and I think that's really true. So uh, even myself, I'm stumbling upon uh, new settings and things that you can do with Transcribus, which are great. Um, but yeah, documenting all of this is also something that we really try to do. And for this, we have a very elaborate help center and try to keep it updated on a constant basis. We also have started this webinar series now, as you might have joined the webinars uh, before. We had in September and this webinar today. 
and we're continuing this. So the next model, the next training models webinar is already in less than a month. Then we will have a closer look at training text models. So um, yeah, if you're interested to train your own text model, um, we have two webinars actually, a more basic one on the 11th of November and a more uh, yeah, in deep, in depth uh, webinar about expert model training where we really talk about advanced settings and how can you can really get the most out of your model training. Um, then you might want to join also on the 19th of November. You can check out all of these events on our website. Yeah, time for questions. I think there is still one issue, um, but we might want to have a look at that later on with uh, hitting H and V, so the shortcuts in the editor that is still causing some problems. The feedback is also very old because we can take it right back to product development and fixed issues. Um, yeah, in first place, try to recreate them and then um, trying to fix them as quickly as possible. That being said, if you have any questions still, please add them to the chat. We've also prepared some slides with questions that came up before uh, hand. So we've tried to compile most of them. Many of those we've already answered during uh, the webinar now. So in preparation, we've tried to add as, man, uh, as many of the answers to these questions to the slides. So um, yeah, in the slides that you can also download, you can check out these questions. If there are still some unanswered, unanswered questions, you can always uh, send us a uh, ticket or a message uh, via the channels that we have in the help center or to our um, help desk e email. And then we will do our best to reply to, to these questions. Um, I think there are some rather specific ones um, I can think of, like, is it available via the API? Currently not. So we're currently not offering table model, for instance, via API. We're planning to do so, but at the moment it's not possible. Um, and many of the other things are, I think, already being answered. Unless anyone wants to ask something still, or Sarah or Helena, have you something that you want to add? Um, I'm just browsing through the questions and see if there's one that we haven't gotten to replying yet. Um, there's still the issue with the what you mentioned before, uh, this horizontal line or vertical line. Um, but I think we probably need to look into that um, after the webinar. Yeah, I think with these specific issues, it's always better to have an in-depth loop and see what is really causing the issue. I can just think of some yeah, bug that is eventually causing this, and then we can try to fix it. Yeah, one thing maybe to add uh, is that it's possible to combine a, a table model and field models. So if you have a table on a page, but you also have a, a marginal note or some other text that you want to, to extract, you can do it. But you have to remember first to run the, the table model, then to you, you can run a, the fill model, um, remember to select uh, the option uh, keep existing layout. Uh, so transcribers will um, create uh, the the fields uh, and add it uh, to the uh, on the same page uh, and keep keeping the table. And then you can run the baseline recognition and the table uh, the text recognition. Yeah, we haven't prepared an example, but. Uh, um, yeah, for example, in the one that uh, uh, Helene showed before, uh, uh, there was a uh, hey, um, some text uh, at the top. Uh, like if you have a data at the top of the page uh, and you want us to extract it, uh, and it's not part of the table, you can do it with a field model. But you have to remember to do the table recognition first, uh, and then the table the field recognition because it doesn't work if you do the other way around. Yeah. There are quite a few paths to glory, so you can really um, have a very different use cases, but still be being able to achieve them. And in the meantime, as you have seen before it failed, now it's running. And in the meantime, we've also fixed that issue. So it was really just the storage of the machine that is basically running the training that was full, and now it's not full anymore. So yeah, we're trying to be quick in fixing issues as 
mistake come up. But that also shows that we're running the infrastructure on our own. So you can at least uh, be um, relieved on that end. Okay, glad to hear Tell me that it also works. But yeah, we will check that out. So we have spent a little bit more this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thanks everybody for joining. It was great to have you here and also to answer your questions. If there are still some questions open, as always, shoot us a message. We're happy to answer them. And we really hope the table model provides some value for you because that's the uh, ultimate goal, to give you a tool to work with this kind of material. And yeah, that being said, keep unlocking. So keep unlocking the past. This, this is our yeah paired mission. We're all on the same page. We're all doing the same. We're trying to unlock the past. And that is great. So thanks a lot. And then hope that everybody will have a nice evening or morning.